today uh, we're going to be talking about Elmish applications, in particularly talking about scaling them and the techniques of breaking them down and seeing how, the, how that works and all. So um, let's get started already. We have a lot of things to talk about today, a very long table of content. Basically, the introduction already started. We're going to, um, because scaling is usually a, a subject of, uh, an advanced subject, I do want to go back to the basics because I want to get everyone on board, even if you don't know Elmish. So I will start with the basics, but we will remedy that real quick when we uh, start making some bigger applications. We'll talk about what is a program, Elmish program. We'll definitely focus on commands, commands in Elmish. They are very important and they are uh, very overlooked when we talk about um, documentation, when we talk about libraries. They're very much overlooked. And then we're going to basically start with some simple application, try to make them bigger and see what problems they make, and somehow try to see how to break them down into smaller applications so we can easily think about them and make them manageable to work with. So this is basically, um, this is basic, basically the talk about scaling applications. It's not that we are scaling them so that they run faster. We are scaling them so that we can work with them in a manage manageable way. We make them smaller, we make them smaller pieces, and wire these pieces together to make bigger pieces, and hopefully it all works the same as it, as it did when it was the big chunk of spaghetti. So we'll look at uh, the challenges of breaking things down and how to uh, build child programs and wire them up. And at the end, we'll talk about a little bit of ongoing development and some resources to learn more. Well, introduction is already doing this. But uh, yeah, so scaling Elmish applications, I think it's a very important subject. It's always um, uh, not very well documented, in my opinion, because every time we, we go, uh, if you go to Elm, you start with the basic, you see the infamous counter example. I know many people are just done with that. We want the actual application. Just enough with the counter. Uh, ironically, I do have a counter example in my slides today. But nevertheless, when you start, to walk, when you start going to, like, now you, your application becomes bigger, you can't just use the same concepts you use with your counter when it becomes bigger. It, it's just, it grows very rapidly and the, the code just becomes spaghetti. So we will look at it as well. The other thing I don't like about the I didn't like about the subject before because if you look at the Elm documentation, Elm documentation is really nice, but they always highlight differences between how well this works and uh, in comparison with a OOP uh, perspective of the subject. They're trying to sell the the uh, the good things about Elm, but we're already sold on these stuff. We want the nitty gritty stuff when things get bigger. So let's get started. <laughs> another counter application, the basics of Elm. I like this example because it already tells you a lot about how Elm works. You have the essential ingredients, basically. You have your state. In your state, you sometimes we call them the model. I like to call them state because it's what is the data you want to keep track of while your application is running. So in this case, we want to, what we want to keep track of in a counter, we want to keep track of our current count, right? And we have a message. And I like to think about message is an event. So events can occur to which your update, to which your ab re uh, application will react to. In this case, my application only react to, reacts to increment and decrement events. And when that happens, some logic will run, which is in the update function. If it's an increment, I make a new state depending on my previous state. If it's a decrement, make a new state based on the previous state. And then at the end, we have the view, which is a function of the current state. You will build the view based on the current state. So the, current, so the view takes in account, um, takes in account the state uh, in every shape. So the view doesn't know how the state is updated. It, know, it knows, I have my state now. I want to build UI from it. You can even define view before your update function. So that's the very basics. Yeah, this is how it works. I use GIFs because and make sure they work. <laughs> so um, when we say when we talk about Elm and basics about them, we have this uh, concept of a Elm program. An Elm program is the is the smallest thing you can make out of an Elmish application. So in this case, every triplet of a uh, init update and view 
you can call them a program. Because if they, when, when they work together, they will form a program. And when you, have, uh, when you have this thing, then your whole application is consisting of a single Elm program. I think it, program, it's like, you can think of it as a component, but again, if you say component, it will say, oh, not in the React sense of a component. It's a component in the sense that these things work together in an isolated manner, right? So we've seen that, and then we have commands. Because um, if we take back, if we take a look back here, this is very, very limited. Like, I get um, my message, and I change my state, and there's, um, and that's it. My messages only, uh, only come from, the, from, my, from my user interaction. I can only have user interaction that trigger these events. But in an application, it's not just the user, inter uh, user interface that is triggering these events, and they are not just synchronous events. So that's where commands come into play, and commands are responsible for scheduling async messages. They're, uh, they're the source of a lot of confusion, and this is how I like to think about them. They schedule async messages. So when you have a command of a message that's basically saying, well, when this thing will run, at some point it will dispatch that message. This, this message will be sent to the Elm program at some point in the future. And uh, to just complicate our uh, counterexample a little bit, we have uh, two more messages here, increment immediate and increment delayed. You see that immediate and delayed already give the sense of time, because they're scheduled at some point. And the increment and decrement are implemented the same way. You have the, your previous state, we compute the next state, we're not scheduling anything, so this in the synchronous uh, sense. But, when the, but then we have increment immediate. And this returns the current state as is, but schedules an increment event that will run right after it. So a new message to run after this runs. So you, it's, like, uh, it's like you're making this chain reaction of, of messages, of your message stream. So when this happens, it will, just, it, will have, it will have basically the same effect as if you ran an increment on its own, but um, from, a, from a command. Why you would do that, this is, you have to be very cautious of this. We will, be, we will talk about this later, uh, why you have to be cautious of it. But again, it's scheduled from a command. And you, have, you can have a different command that schedules an increment after 1,000 milliseconds. That's why it's delayed. So, you can schedule messages for a later time to run, and this looks like that. So commands, again, they schedule messages. The messages will, uh, will, become, will come back to the update function, and we will see how that works as well. So uh, I got another example, another example just to, uh, to get the basics right, because um, this is an example of a uh, an application that has this uh, get data pattern, which is start the loading, and now we're loading, and the data comes in. And this is a very common pattern when you, when you want to load the data. I have here a very simple mock. Uh, when you start the loading, the state becomes loading. And after one second, we will receive data. There is nothing that can, wrong, that can go wrong here. Uh, you can think of this as an example of getting the data from a U API, but here I'm just saying, well, I want you to dispatch this message after, uh, after one second, which will come here, make my state loaded data, and schedule nothing afterwards. And of course, when you reset, you go back to initial. This is just to um, enforce the idea that your view has to account for, your, for every state you can have while application is running. The view will account for your state while in its initial mode, then we will have a button that will start the loading. In a normal application, you have a button that loads some external data. You will have a state when, when it's loading. You have a view when it's loading, and you have a state when it's loaded. And in this case, after something is loaded, I will show the message, and I will be able to reset back. It looks like this. We have start loading, and this is my very high definition GIF. Yep, it's here, and you can oh, 
you can re you can reset. Just we'll skip that part. So you get uh, you get you click on reset, and your state uh, goes back to initial. All right. Why did I show these? Um, oh yeah, this this is. This could be a more realistic example of what I've just shown. We are asking some, for some data, and we're saying what messages to dispatch when the data comes in, if, uh, if there was an error, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is an example of it, but we won't use that. It's just an, uh, I used the, the simplified load data example. All right, I showed you these two examples because I want to combine the two in a bigger application, right? I want now I have these two different programs, basically, because the, everyone ha every component has its own, has its own uh, way of interacting. You have its own view, it has its own updates, has its own init, and we want to combine them. Because, for example, if you have a web application, you can have multiple pages, and you want to uh, develop each page as its own thing. You don't start with your application and have, you don't mix the messages and you don't mix, you, you don't want to mix the messages and you don't want to mix the state. As you will see, this is not very, um, very nice to have. So we will start with spaghetti and we'll see how that goes. So demo time to go here. Apps, spaghetti zero and I think Yep, it's going to take a couple of seconds. Go to local host 8080. Wait for it to run. There are two applications so that should go fast. Yes, yes. Yeah, we have the application running, we have spaghetti, which is both applications in tabbed mode. So we have a tab, we can switch back forth between the counter and the loader. I called the second one a loader because it loads data, which is just easier to think about it. We have a counter, increment delayed works as well, and we have a loader and you can start loading, you can go back and forth and, the, uh, and everything is in sync. So let's look at the code of this one. It's only one file called application. This is the, the first thing you try when you want to make something bigger than uh, your counter. You just, you just put more messages in there, and, you, and, you, uh, and, and the state becomes not only the state of your application, but, only, but also like we have all the fields from all our, our children, because the, the count is is, uh, because the count is for the counter page and the loader is for the loader page, but also our bigger app will be uh, will also be tracking will also be tracking on what page we are, so that we can switch between between the tabs and uh, and the state will change between the children as well. In our in, uh, so I have the have pages here. I have loader state and the state of the app. Next, I have the messages that can change that can change the the application and these are from both the counter and the loader, and the navigate to is like the, uh, is, is a message that is specific to the app itself, because I want to switch back and forth between the messages. In the initialization, I init, I init all the fields like usual. In the update, everything is the same as it was, um, as it was when, when, they were, when they were alone, when they were separate, but now we just have these multiple paths of where code could execute, right? And then we have the navigate to page. This is like the extra, the extra field that is specific to the parent, but the others are just specific to the child, to the children. We have some, uh, some helper functions. We have the render with some navigation. It's not really important. We have just like the nav item that will switch back and forth between the, between the two. And, and if, it's, um, if the current state is a, is a counter, then load the counter app. If it's the current state is a loader, then load the loader app, et cetera, et cetera. And then you could put all things in a div and, and run it. Well, this works fine 
for this very simple application. But as you can see, I hope, I hope you're seeing it too, uh, the update function grows very, grows very big, very fast, because these two simple applications, a counter and a loader, like red, they're the simplest thing you can have, and your update function is already starting to have all these branches of code. And what we try, um, like if you think about it, if you have a web application, if you have two pages, and you have all, and you have both pages in here, you could you could the, you could have the possibilities that you ha that you uh, trigger some events that change state in another page. That's definitely not something you want happening. Uh, if, unless you actually want that, unless you actually want that, and there are patterns to do to do the sibling communication, we'll talk about that later. But essentially, it comes down to uh, when we want to build multiple, uh, when we want a bigger application, we want to break it down in smaller applications. So if we look at the code here, we were, we are seeing we're already kind of seeing the pattern here. We have messages, but we know these three are specific to one thing. And we know the other three are specific to one thing, so we can just put them in their own type, in their own uh, loader message, and their own counter message, right? So we know, uh, we know things that do things with loader are, are inside, are beneath the loader message type. The same with state. We know this is the count state, so we can put it in its own type. We can put the loader in its own type. They are, they're here, because they're simple, they're a single field, they could be easily uh, put down, like I could add a, an alias for an integer and call it counter state. But the idea is if you have, uh, if your parent has uh, children, every child has its own type and they, and they will be fields of the overall application. Same goes for update. I just, I will need to check if it's, um, I will need to, I need to change these. If it's a counter message, then I will go to the path of my counter. If it's a loader message, I'll go to the, to the path of my Loader, but how do we do that? Is the question, and the same goes with the view. We want to break them down. We want to have, um, we want to have every, every part as its own thing. So that's the spaghetti. The spaghetti work is done. We can see. Um, I've already. I, I was. I was thinking about actually live coding the the results, but I did it on my own, and it takes way too long. So I just did it beforehand, and it's the refactored spaghetti. So while it works, while it starts running, I will take a look at my first attempt at refactoring them. First of all, I started putting things in their own files, right? Because I want to think of them as separate things. The first thing I do is separate, is separate them in files. Of course, not just because I put them in their own files, that means they're separated, because that's artificially, uh, artificially uh, breaking them down. But let's, look at, let's take a look at their inside. And if we look at the counter uh, example, I've just removed everything and and left the counter alone. So the counter, this was the first example I started with, but it's totally self-contained. It has its own triplet, its own init, its own update, its own message, and the view will make the counter, right? Same goes for the loader. The loader has its own state, its own message, its own init, its own view, and its own yeah, just its, its own thing, basically. But now the app has to do things differently. App has now, uh, app still keeps track of its own data. In this case, it only keeps track, keeps track of its own page. If it had more fields, it will just go there. But, if, uh, but it knows that these are the child these are the child states. So it keeps track of its own fields, but also every, uh, the state of every, uh, of every child. We will, this is one way of doing it. We will look, uh, we also take a look at another ways of breaking things down. And, but in this way, I'm keeping state of all children because the state is kept in there. I'm not switching the state. I'm keeping the state of all children at the same time. 
I've broken down my messages into, well, I could only have a counter message, which will map to the messages from my counter. And like, uh, um, from my, from my counter, like the increment and, inc and decrement and decrement delayed, and put them in their own thing. Then I have my initialization, which is basically, if you want to initialize a parent, well, you initialize the children, and the state of the children, the initial state of the children, is whatever the init of the, of the uh, separate children give you. So we have the counter, we initialize the counter, we get a counter, an initial counter state, and at the initial state of the parent, the initial state of the parent, well, the current page, we just, use, we, we just choose that because it's in this state, but the counter, the initial counter, we don't know because that's given to us by the, initial, by the initialization of the counter itself. So when you want to initialize a parent, you initialize all the children, you give the initial state to the, to the state of the parent because the parent wants to keep track of the, of the children as well. We will take a look at the commands. Commands are a different story, the map. We will just take this. Uh, we just skip this for a moment because I want to talk about the updates. Uh, updates first. So the first thing you initialize is the data, and the second thing we, we want to update is when we is when we get is when we get a message. Do we get a counter message? Well, if we get a counter message and we're keeping track of the state of the counter, and we have a, and we have a way of updating, namely the update function in the counter, we just pass, the, pass them both to counter there in the counter update, and we get a next state, of a next counter state, and some other command. So when we get a next, the next state of the counter, we just put it in the current state, in the parent. So whenever the parent needs to update the children, it just tells the children, well, you update yourself and get me whatever you're updating. So whatever value you're updating, you get it back and you put it in the, in the parent state, right? So far, so good. Same goes with the loader. It's basically, it's basically the same all over the place. And um, yeah, we will talk about commands in a second because that's usually the confusion because we know if you have, uh, because this is F-sharp, right? If you, have a big, if you have a big update function and you can break it down in smaller update functions because you can update parts of it and, and synchronize parts of it because that's just data. It goes, it goes, uh, it goes from top, uh, to top, down, top to bottom. But commands are not as straightforward. Anyways, we go to the render. Same here. We get a, uh, we check the current state. Is it our, uh, the current page? Are we on the counter page? And then we want it to view the counter using the current counter state. And we are making a new dispatch, a new child dispatch for the counter. Same goes for the loader. Same goes for the loader. We are making and uh, we are viewing the loader and giving it its state, its current state, because that's what we're keeping track of. And we're giving it a load, a new dispatch. So far, so good. I think it's building now. It's refactored spaghetti. So increment delayed. It all works. Yeah, cool. Oh, reset doesn't. Details, right? So I think it's clear now how the data is communicated. The, com the data, uh, we st and if I want to initialize application, I will have to initialize both of them and update application. If I have to, uh, if I have to update the application, I update. Based on the message, I'll update the child, and whatever new state I get from my child, I will just plug it in back to my parent, and I get a new state for the parent. Data goes from top to bottom. I hope that's clear for now. Yeah. And now, we'll have to take a look at the dispatch, right? Because uh, the dispatch is not top to bottom. The dispatch does not go from app. Uh, just the, uh, if counter dispatches something, it's not going up to the app. I'll show you why. So the, I, think the, I think the dispatch is uh, very important to understand how it works with, uh, how it works with, uh, with Elmish. Because when you start with your root application, and you have your dispatch, and you dispatch something, 
uh, from your, for example, if you're at, the, at your view, someone clicks something and you dispatch, it goes back to the Elm runtime, the library itself, and it knows, okay, uh, I am dispatched a counter message, so I will just give it back, I will give the, I will give the message to the update function. That's how, um, that's how the update function works, right? If you, um, if I go to my spaghetti, that's the easier example. So whenever I dispatch increment here, it just goes, because dispatch is given by Elmish, right? Elmish gives you the dispatch that tells you you can use it in your view. When you use it in your view, when you actually call it with a message, it will call the update function, gets a new, gets a new state, and, and it renders again. So the dispatch given by Elmish, dispatch given by Elmish, when you call it with a message, it will do stuff. It will call update, it will call the root level update, the update you gave it when you initialized your program, right? My mouse doesn't work right. Okay. So here when we initialize our program, we basically gave Elm only the root level program. We gave it an initialization, an update, and a render. So what Elmish does, it gives you a dispatch. When that runs, it will run the update again that you gave it on only that update function it's going to run. And compute a new state, you have a new state, compute, re-render the view, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens when you want your child to dispatch something? There is no, um, there is no, uh, there's no shared, there's no like a, an ambient runtime for every child program. The way we are making child programs is just a way of refactoring the bigger application into smaller applications. But it's still just one runtime and one root program. We are, we are making the techniques of uh, breaking them down into the children applications. So when my child program has the dispatch that I'm giving from my root program, and, it call, and, it, and the child program calls that, that dispatch, well, that dispatch is going to give a message to the, run, to the Elmish runtime. But there's a problem. There's a problem with that. Because this dispatch from my counter takes a counter message. It's the message of the, of the counter module. Right? It's this message. So if counter dispatches increment or decrement, it gives it back, it gives it back to the Elm uh, runtime. The Elm runtime doesn't doesn't know how to work with that because the root program doesn't know how to work with that. The root program has a different kind of messages. The root program is expecting one of these. Is expecting either a counter message, a loader message, and a navigate to. And if you only send a counter message, then it doesn't know how to work with that. So the way we do that is by making a new, a new specific child dispatch. Well, it's very simple to do it in F sharp. We are just uh, doing, we're just doing this composition. I think it's not. Uh, I always think this this is very um, weird to look at. If you if you if you see if you're seeing this for the first time, it's very weird. But we can be very explicit about it, and we say let uh, counter. So we're at the program level, and we need to make a dispatch for the counter, right? So we make a counter dispatch which is a function that takes a counter message. It takes a counter message. We put, we put it in an app message, which is a counter message of that counter message. Now we, now we have an application message that we can dispatch, uh, dispatch app message. So we are dispatching a message. Now, now, this is, now this is something I could give to the runtime, and the runtime gives to my update function. So I'm giving this here. It's exactly the same. So whenever we are, uh, we are, whenever we are giving the dispatch down to the child, we have, to make, uh, we have to do some wrapping. We have to do some wrapping, because whenever it goes up to the Elmish application, it has to know, it, it has to be of the of the top level type. The top level type is the application message type I defined earlier here. 
So only then, the app, only then the app can react to that message and send the message down to the child in here. So after we've done the wrapping and the counter, and uh, after we've done the wrapping, and we are in the counter, and the counter dispatches increment, for example, well, which this, what, what the child dispatch will do is it will wrap it in a bigger counter and then move it to the Elm program that, uh, that will give, that will uh, run, run, the, run the update function and run the data communication program, run this diagram. But the thing is, when you have a child, it always go, goes back to the, to the main dispatch. So you don't have, so every dispatch of the child is actually just the same dispatch with uh, multiple wrappings done on it. So let me make sure this actually works. So we are making a counter dispatch and, uh, explicitly in this way. Yeah, so it's actually it's it's from the child going back to the uh, first being wrapped, going back to the runtime, and getting down on the update function of the of the parents. So that's one so that's one challenge of so that's one challenge of understanding how you how you make these things smaller. When you make things smaller, you have to propagate a couple of things. You have to propagate the data. We understand that because that's top to level uh, top down model, but uh, the dispatch, you have to understand, it's always going back to the Elm program and running it from the root, from the root app. Same goes for loader. I could, make it disp I could make it an explicit way, but I think you understand a counter message comes in from the child, wrap it in an app message, dispatch it. And when you dispatch it here, it, goes, it comes from me. Yeah, I, I explained this. So... So that's when, so that's when we want to make, so that's when we are, uh, that's when, when we when we want to dispatch things in our children. But our children not only dispatch things from their view, they only schedule, they also schedule new commands, because the increment, for example, increment delayed is something scheduled from the from the child. But how is the but how is this go, is this being reacted to? That's, that lies in this magical function called CMD map. CMD map is very important because when we when we look at the next counter command, the thing that we, the, the second uh, the second uh, element of the tuple we got back from the update function, it's a it's a it's a command of a counter message. But I, but if that, but if that is scheduled and that uh, is run, I don't understand that the, the Elm, uh, the top level Elm program doesn't understand a specific uh, message from the counter module. So what we do, uh, we map, we map the result of that command, and I will do it here explicitly. So next command is a, uh, is a command of a counter message, but I don't want counter message. I want this. So I have next counter command. I will map it. Next counter command can schedule a message at any point. So whenever a message is dispatched, counter message. I don't understand that. I only understand it when it's wrapped. That's the same thing. But this is being more explicitly about what's going on because a uh, count, uh, next counter message can dispatch something that I don't understand. So I understand it by wrapping it in a counter message of this component, of the parent component, and then and then it all works out because this app this uh, understands my uh, this application understands my message and thus the Elm runtime as well. So. <laughs> I think this is very um, very clear now because we have our root application it gives the wrapped dispatch and whenever a uh, wrapped dispatch is called going down and we have the and commands being being mapped being wrapped as well. So yeah I think we talked about like this was if if you get anything uh, of this talk I, 
the command part and the, the command part and the wrapping of the dispatch is very important. That's very, if you get that, that's perfect. And now we can look, take a look at other division, uh, division patterns of, the, of your application, because w when we started, I said, we have all states, because we're keeping track of all states here and having, the, and having the current page as a flag, then you can switch, and depending on that, you show the current page. But this is not the only way you can do it. And um, according to some users, uh, Maxime and Kirji, uh, they say that if you have multiple app, if you have um, if you have a lot of up, a lot of pages and their pages have, if you have a, a big graph, basically, then structure equality will start making performance impacts on your application because it's checking whether all the graph is all the graph is, is structurally is structurally equal. But you can, well, this is not the only way you can do it. You can do it by keeping state of a single child, the single current child. We can take a look at that as well. Sometimes this takes too long. So going back to apps. To refactored spaghetti do. Now will be this one. Oops, it seemed that my .NET restored is not working properly. But this is another way of dividing your different pages because your different page does not own, does not your parent page doesn't have to uh, keep track of all of all children. You can keep track of your current child, and whenever you switch, you just reset the state. Like if I'm um, if I'm, I'm at my at my current state is just a, is just a page and a page has that state. When I want to update, when I want to initialize, it's the same. In this case, I want to initialize the counter, give the initial state to my counter, and give it the command. When I update, I'm checking if I'm like, if my current page is a counter with this state and I received a counter message, then same story. Call the update of the counter and um, com compute the next state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I only have a different logic for the navigate, but that's not uh, relevant, not very relevant. But the thing is, you can have um, you can have these uh, different ways of breaking the, breaking things down. You can have them as distinct children or multiple children. And the question is, when do you use one or the other? Well, it, it depends, of course. It always depends. But for example. Um, for example, in scenarios where you have tabbed content, if you have a page with multiple tabs, you already seen this from the from the React performance. If you if you were here a couple hours earlier, if you have tabbed content, you probably want to keep track of all of them because if you if the user is switching between tab one and tab two, the user expects that the data um, is still the same. That's why you don't reset every every page when you. Uh, when you're in a tab, but if you have um, when you have different pages on your web on your website, and these pages change when your URL changes, then you probably can have distinct uh, distinct patterns, uh, distinct uh, children. So we will see how this is different. Then this is refactored spaghetti too. Uh, again, I think I think everyone is bored now. So I'll see. I'll show something different, which is. Um, this is something to keep track uh, to uh, to have uh, in mind. I just said that if you have a, pa uh, a tabbed page, uh, you probably want to keep track of all children, and this is keeping track of a single child. And this is a problem you can get. You can, for example, start loading, go to the counter, or go back to the loader. When you go back to the loader, the data is reset, but the command that is scheduled it's still running in the background. So when it finishes loading, it says data is loading, even though I was even though I started, I, well, reset doesn't work, of course. But the thing is, if you're, if you're here and, and you go to the counter and you go back, the data comes in, but uh, I, I was resetting. So this is something to keep, uh, to keep in mind. In Elm, we don't have, in Elm, we don't have a way of canceling an ongoing request. So the only thing we can do now is um, 
having some uniqueness, uniqueness for the request, so that when the data comes back, if you, um, if you switched and you got back, and the message is scheduled and got you the result, you can put some logic to ignore it. If you're, for example, I had this, uh, had this application where I had a multiple projects, and when you click on one, the data is loaded, and, uh, when you, and the data also had, had, tapped image, uh, had tapped views in them. So what I had to do, if I'm, load, if, I'm in a, if I'm in a project and the data that comes back is from a different project, then just ignore it. So basically just ignoring logic. For now, we can't, for now, uh, we don't know how to, in, in Elmish, there's no built-in way of canceling an ongoing, uh, an ongoing scheduled command. So this is something to, to keep in mind, but for the rest, this is just another way of dividing your children into multiple components. So back to this one. Um, yeah, so when you start, when you start building this, when you start breaking things down, of course, there is a, a recommended uh, directory structure. I don't think this is of utmost importance, but it helps to um, it helps to understand how you put things in a different in a different directory. For example, if you have if you have small components, you could put them in their own file. But if they start to become really really large, you uh, you start putting things in their own uh, in their own file. So every component becomes a directory, and that directory has state update and render or view, whatever you want to call it. Or sometimes you also put your HTTP specific uh, command in, in HTTP uh, in an HTTP file or REST file, however you, however you like to think about it. But this is a recommended way. It's really easy to, um, for uh, someone who is new to the, new, to the code base to understand where he has to go if he, um, if he, wants, to learn, if he wants to learn how it works. Well, if, you, if there's something wrong with the state with the, in, in that page, well, you go to the page. Um, so it, it, the, thing, the idea is that the directory reflects the structure of the application itself. So you can choose whether you want to have in a single, in a single file or have them broken down. So the design principles of this, what do we gain? What do we gain from this? Uh, what did we do and what did we gain? Uh, the children are basically isolated. That's the, that's the main principles. They don't know about their parents. They don't know about their siblings because there's, there's no way the counter could do something to the loader. And same goes for the loader. It doesn't know that there is a counter. It doesn't know that there is something else going on in the, in the sibling or in, the, in some other part of the subtree of your whole application. So you have a child that don't know about the siblings, and the parent has to manage the communication between, uh, between the children as well. So we end up with a modular application. Uh, isolated programs are easier to work with because we start, we, we like this of having, of having this um, modularized applications. We want, if we are at some page, we only want to think about what's happening in that page, irrespective of what's happening outside of it. And yeah, Isaac cannot change basically data from outside their program. They, they just, they don't know how to. Their, their parents know how to take their data and do something with it, but in the context of a single program, it doesn't know how to change data outside of that. So the cause of that, we, we have to explicitly write the, we have to write the, the wiring logic of these components, right? So some people would think, well, it, the, we have all this repeated code. There's, there must be some way of automating this. There must be some library or some helpers. You don't want to automate this for, some, for the following reason. I had that wiring communication. You don't want to um, always uh, automate it because the components are not always isolated. You, there are many cases where you want to have a single component communicate with some other place in your, uh, in your tree logic, in your, um, in your application. It doesn't matter whether, whether it's in this level or some other level uh, up in the tree. So we'll see how this works. And we'll take a look at an example of the communication between sibling components. All right, so I have the lonely siblings. Yep, and this does, 
Let's take a look at the code. The code is basically the same as the first refactored application, but with the addition of a settings. The settings has, uh, the the settings has just a, a factor, a, just a number, basically, and it will change, uh, the, and the counter has a factor as well. So we, we don't want to increase the counter just by one. We want to have this uh, one configurable. But we don't want to. But we don't want the configuration in the counter. We want the configuration be in the, in the settings in the settings page. So it's wor it works. So I'm at the settings. I can change the set settings here, but uh, the counter still increments by one. It's not a bug. I haven't implemented it. So um, so we're here. Every component runs on its own, but I need some way of I need some way of knowing if if my changes change, if my settings change, I want to change the state of my counter. Well, if we look at my if we look at the parent, we have here the settings message, right? And we don't have to uh, we don't have we don't have to react to changes in the settings. Because we are the ones who are applying the, we are the ones who are making these changes. When the changes happen in the settings, that they happen because we called the update, we call the update function, and we and we made a new state out of it. So at this point, I can just say, well, I don't just want my next state to be this. I want my next state to be my next state with with. Uh, with the counter to be, well, state dot counter with, uh, with factor, uh, state counter, factor be my, the next settings, because settings is, Settings dot factor. This doesn't work for some reason because I need to put a factor alone. Oh yeah, next step. Oh, it's not a factor because my next uh, because the state is just one thing in my settings. Uh, the state is just the selected count factor. So um, in my app, I could just say uh, settings. I could just call it next factor. And here, I will initialize it. And my next factor also becomes the factor of the counter. It has loaded, so increment by one, settings, make it 10, increment by 10. So basically, what we did is we intercepted. Yes, sir. Uh, what we did was we intercepted, uh, we intercepted the message from, um, from settings. We didn't intercept it because there's just one message. But basically, the idea is when something happened between the children, you see, OK, what happened? Uh, what happened in my child? And based on that, you can, um, you can send either different messages to your, other, to your other children or have different, or maybe send different commands to their other children. So, the, you can, uh, so in here, in this place, you could have the logic of, OK, this happened. Um, what happened? You can you can uh, go pattern matching about which message exactly happened in my child, and uh, and based on that, do other things with other children. So basically, something happens in my child, I could go and do th things with my other ch children. So the parent not only uh, manage the, dif the the distinct state of the children, they manage their communication between them if needed. So uh, it seems that I have to uh, wrap up. Let's see how, uh, I think I'm almost done though with the, with the presentation. Yeah, there's ongoing development. Of course, we already know uh, 
React Elm is, is based, we default to React as the renderer, which is very good, because React has a vast uh, ecosystem of, of plugins. We could just pull in and make a little binding for it, and it's already working with our application. Uh, some ongoing do documentation, we definitely need more documentation. Your help is needed with this, ex especially documentation. Um, there's a lot of work to do in other platforms because we usually focus on, focus on web development, but there's a lot of things we can do with Electron, React Native, Node, even Cordova for those who still love these things. Of course, your help is needed in all of this, and uh, PRs are always welcome. Resources to learn more. Yeah, the slides and all these apps. Uh, ironically, uh, I have these four apps. I, it, it, it would have been a much nicer if I made a bigger application having all four apps, and you could have and, and you could switch between them. But I didn't have this in, in this um, in this talk, so I think I have the excuse of leaving it as an exercise to the reader. You make a bigger applications of the applications we saw today. Uh, so it's here. I just made it. I just made the repo public. We also have the project that I've been working on for a very, very long time. It's called the Tabula Rasa project, which is a safe application that has, that has deep nesting and deep routing, basically implements all the things I've been uh, showing you here. And um, of course, there's a full my demo from Maxim, a very nice application I think he showed you this morning as well. Uh, yeah, we need, we need a lot more, and you can help with that as well. And if you want to get started really easily, I've made a couple of templates to, uh, to get you up and running. So I think that wraps it up for, for today. If you have any... Uh, Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have time for questions. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much.